Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Sean Pepin. I'm one of the regional coordinators for Guided Pathways in the LA and Orange County region. Um, we started these rapid webinars really with the intention to provide quick um, overviews of new and innovative practices that are going on throughout the state that are really focused on increasing student completion and eliminating equity gaps. Um, for this webinar, if you want to pose any questions to the Cuyamaca team um, when we get started, feel free to do so in the chat. The chat bar feature should be um, open and available for you to write questions there. Just as a quick reminder, too, that all of these rapid webinars are recorded and transcribed. Um, they are also sent out usually by the next day and can be found on the Vision Resource Center. And this one can also be found on the CAP website. Um, if you're in the Vision Resource Center, you can go to the top search bar and just type in rapid webinar and you'll be able to find it within about a day or so. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over to uh, my wonderful colleague, Stacey Teeters, who will introduce the Cuyamaca team. So hello, everyone. My name is Stacey Teeters. I'm one of the Guided Pathways Regional Coordinators here in the San Diego Imperial Region, along with my partner in crime, Wendy Smith. Uh, we do have the pleasure of in, uh, introducing our two presenters from Cuyamaca College today, Rachel Polakowski and Tammy Marshall. Rachel has a long history of working in education, first teaching middle school and high school for 10 years in the K-12 system, and has spent the last five years teaching in Cuyamaca College's math department. Based on her work and dedication, Rachel became a full-time professor two years ago and has played an instrumental role in supporting their departmental community of practice. Tammy has been a math faculty member at Cuyamaca College for the past 23 years, and she's the current chair of the math department with nine years of experience in that role. As you may know, Cuyamaca is well known for their work as, being, uh, work as early adopters of basic skills reforms. Rachel, Tammy, and many other colleagues at Cuyamaca have worked to holistically redesign the basic skills pipelines to recognize student capacity, which in turn has helped many more students to succeed and equity gaps to significantly decrease in their math, English, and ESL pathways at the college. Rachel and Tammy have also been helping to support colleagues in the state through their work in the, the math team for the California Acceleration Project, who's co-sponsoring today's webinar. Tammy has also been sharing her expertise nationally as a facilitator for the University of Texas at Austin's Dana Center for Math Pathways. Having formerly worked at the Grossmont Cuyamaca Community College District, I've seen firsthand the impact that this work has made in the lives of students in advancing equity. So I'm excited today that Rachel and Tammy will be able to share more about Cuyamaca's journey and the power that developing faculty communities of practice and support can have in this work and the innovations that they've been made in moving this into the virtual world. So with that, please give us a big virtual round of applause to welcome today's rapid webinar presenters, Rachel Polakowski and Tammy Marshall. Thank you so much, Sean and Stacy. Excited to be here and share uh, what we're doing at Cuyamaca College with um, others around the state. So, Today I'm going to be talking to you about the community of practice and how it has helped us in this pivot to um, online instruction uh, due to COVID-19. So I wanted to start with just a common definition of what a community of practice is for those of you that have never heard of the term before. Um, a communities of practice are groups of people who share a common uh, a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. Um, there's lots of definitions out there for a community of practice, but I really liked this one because of the emphasis on by participating in a community of practice, we become better educators. So that's um, one of the reasons why I chose this one. So at, at Cuyamaca College, we have several community of practices in the math department. Um, we separate the community of practices by, by subjects. So it's subject specific teachers that are getting together to meet regularly throughout the semester. Um, so we have a community of practice for statistics. So all of the st statistics teachers get together. Uh, we have one for pre-calculus and we have one for business calculus. And the reason why we chose those three to start was um, due to our early implementation of co-requisite classes those were our, our supported co-requisite classes at the transfer level that we knew we were going to need some extra support for, for faculty. Um, since starting these community of practices and, and seeing 
uh, the benefits of them. We've talked about making it more expansive and, and possibly including a, a calculus community of practice or including other courses that might not be that entry level transfer course. The meetings are held usually weekly or, or every other week throughout the semester. Again, that kind of changes depending on the participants and the needs of, of the people within the community of practice. There's a facilitator who's responsible for creating agendas and they moderate the meetings for the group. Um, and so we, we usually choose the facilitator each year at the start of the school year. We'll decide amongst those in the community of practice who the facilitator is going to be. And our communities of practice are a mixture of part-time and full-time faculty um, all working together. So again, I mentioned that we started the community of practices at Cuyamaca when we made that transition to co-requisite support, kind of eliminating the traditional remedial pipeline. And we felt like we were jumping off of a cliff trying to build this plane <laughs> as we were trying to fly it. Um, and, and so there was a lot of uncertainty. There were a lot of fears about the changes we were making um, and just a general sense of like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? <laughs> So this image has been used a lot within, uh, within the Cuyamaca Math Department to kind of uh, give a picture to how we were feeling uh, going into that transition that we made in uh, 2016. Um, since then, we've put the plane together. Uh, it's fully functional. Things are going well. But, you know, with things like COVID-19, we've definitely hit some turbulence. So we've seen the importance of uh, the community of practice coming into play again um, now. So the goals for a community of practice is to provide ongoing support for faculty. That's kind of the main goal. Um, the three things we focus on are changing expectations of faculty, supporting implementation of pedagogical reforms, and providing intentional support for the effective domain of our faculty. So just like the types of environments that we're creating for our students in the classroom, those are the same things that we're doing in the community of practice. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we started these in 2016 and, and at the time we were asking um, teachers who were very experienced in a lecture format style of teaching to transition to more of a student-centered group learning way of teaching. And that change uh, meant that we did need to change the expectations of faculty of what, what the class was going to look like, what learning was going to look like, what the student experience was going to look like. Um, and we needed to support our faculty with those pedagogical reforms through ongoing support. So those weekly or every other week meetings provided that support needed. In the classroom a lot, we talk about just-in-time remediation for our students. The community of practice is almost like a just-in-time remediation for our faculty that need that extra support. And then the, the third one there, providing intentional support for the effective domain of our faculty. This is probably one of the most important um, aspects of the community of practice. Really um, acknowledging that as faculty, we need to feel supported in our work environment in order to do our best. And so that was one of the main goals of a community of practice. So I wanted to spend a moment talking about what that kind of looks like in the community of practice. Uh, we try to address the fears of faculty, you know, getting them out front and at, said out loud. That was one of our first community of practice meetings about, you know, what fears do you have about this transition, uh, which is just as applicable now with um, our, our pivot to remote teaching and learning. Uh, there's a lot of fears from faculty. And so addressing those fears, talking about those fears is very, very important um, in a way that we can um, support faculty and help them see that their fears are common. They're not alone in their fears and there's a way out. There's solutions to those, those fears that they have. Another thing is uh, setting a safe environment for full-time and part-time faculty to participate in the community of practice. I mentioned that there's a mixture of full-time and part-time faculty in our, in our COPs. And it's so, so important for the full-time faculty to take on the role of vulnerability within the group. 
home. A lot of times there's this power dynamic between full-time and part-time faculty, many part-time faculty wanting to get a job at the college that they're participating in this community of practice. And it can seem unsettling or part-time faculty can feel uneasy sharing the problems they're having in the classroom uh, with other faculty because it might, you know, shine a light on some of their weaknesses that they're having. And that's not the goal of the community of practice. The goal of the community of practice is to help, help all faculty with those weaknesses and help them become better educators. So providing that safe environment is very, very important. And as a full-time faculty member in a community of practice, it's your role and responsibility to, to make yourself vulnerable and share those times when your lesson plan just fell flat on its face and nothing worked about it, or when you're really struggling with that one student, getting them to engage in the classroom activities or um, getting them to uh, uh, come to class or turn in homework, whatever it is. Um, as a full-timer, it's very, very important to model that vulnerability so that way part-time faculty feel as if it's a safe place where they can say their mistakes and know that they're gonna be supported in them. And then the third thing is kind of honoring uh, all faculty by paying people for their time. Um, when we started these uh, changes with the, in 2016, we were using some grant funding. Um, and since then the grant has run out and the college has supported us in continuing with this community of practice. Um, your college could possibly find funding maybe with student equity funds, um, since that's what kind of the focus of the community of practice is. It's really supporting student equity and, and helping with retention and, and completion rates for all students. So just some things to think about um, and the importance of attending to the effective domain of faculty, just like we do for our students in the classroom. It's just as important. So some community of practice meeting agenda items. These are some kind of common agenda items of things that we've talked about in our community of practices over the years. Um, you know, it's changed and it will continue to change. The, the community of practice meeting really evolves with the people that participate in it. So when we started in 2016, we were focusing a lot on things like subject matter training for faculty. At the time, we all of a sudden needed a lot, uh, a lot more statistics instructors, and we didn't have a lot of faculty that felt confident teaching statistics. So we spent a lot of time in the statistics community of practice talking about those common misconceptions that students have surrounding uh, various statistics topics and talking about how to address those in the classroom when they come up, you know. Since then, we, we've now been teaching, many of the faculty within the statistics community of practice have been teaching statistics for many years, so we don't address that as much. Sometimes something might come up with a new community of practice member, but that's not a focus of our community of practice anymore. Other things that we focused on um, in very, we heavily emphasized at the beginning was working on lesson plans and trying to work together to kind of lighten that teacher load of coming up with these lesson plans. Because as I mentioned, we were trying this new kind of student-centered learning environment, which a lot of us did not have experience with. So we were working on developing lesson plans and revising lesson plans as we taught them to make them better as we experimented with this, with this new way of teaching. And, you know, since then, we have made some major changes and with the transition to remote teaching and learning, there's been even more changes. So with COVID-19 and our somewhat swift transition to online learning, a lot of us felt like this little dog here. We were thrown into the deep end <laughs> and we were trying to keep our head above water and we needed that little life vest to help us out. And that life vest was the community of practice. You know, we, we had already established our community of practice and we were meeting every other week going into the pivot to online teaching and learning. But that, that transition kind of scared us all. We were nervous about it. All of a sudden we were new teachers. Um, and so we needed that support of the community of practice. So we started meeting weekly. Um, 
and, and those weekly meetings are driven by when is everyone available to meet. So we make sure that it's, it's at a time when everyone can get there. Um, so that way no one misses out on our community of practice. So it just so happens we meet on Fridays for two hours. The focus of our community of practice agendas have really changed uh, to a heavy emphasis on Zoom and Canvas training. Uh, we had varying levels of experience with online teaching. Some of the teachers in the communities of practice uh, have been certified to, for distance education and have been teaching online for several years and others never have. Um, but even with that previous years of experience of teaching online, it's a lot different. And I know that you have felt this too. It's a lot different teaching online in the midst of a global pandemic with students who didn't sign up for an online class to begin with. So it's so, so important that we have this community of practice to support the faculty as they move through this transition with the students. We had to rethink policies and practices. Um, you know, it, all of a sudden, our traditional somewhat strict late work policy didn't seem so relevant considering what was going on in the world. So we really had to talk it out with each other. And you know, each teacher has their own policies, but really talking about why those policies are in place and how, how we can change them to help students succeed given the current climate. We had to adapt lesson plans for online instruction, and we still are. As I mentioned, we were so focused on group work and kind of activity-based instruction. Um, and we're still trying to do that in our Zoom lesson plans. But, you know, I can't hand out Skittles for an activity for my students on sampling. Uh, so I need to find other resources that I can use online. And having the brains of my fellow faculty out there looking for resources as well and coming up with ideas, it really lightens my load as a teacher. We've spent a lot of time focusing on student engagement and retention. I know that many of you have probably felt that shift with all of a sudden you lost contact with some of your students that were coming to class regularly. And how do we deal with that? You know, talking about strategies of getting students to engage in the class when all of a sudden they are working more hours because they are essential workers um, or they're struggling with, you know, depression or anxiety and, and they can't find the motivation to do the work or to come to class. So talking about those issues as faculty and talking about strategies we've used and how to help students in our own classes. And lastly, um, just kind of as I mentioned, surviving as faculty during this time, making sure that just like that little dog, our head is above water, um, attending to our effective needs in this transition because as I mentioned, it, it was a very, you know, um, a scary time to make this transition as a faculty member and um, dealing with the uncertainty of students as well just kind of piles that on. So it, it was great to have a space where um, as faculty, we could kind of voice those concerns of, you know, how do we get through all of these problems and to have the support of other faculty there that are going through the same thing. So. Um, the community of practice has really been essential for us in this transition to remote teaching and learning um, just to provide a space where as a faculty member we don't feel like we're teaching on an island by ourselves but that we have a community to help us um, in this transition and this time of change. Rachel, we have a quick question right now sure. from the chat um, regarding some of your teaching strategies. So does a certain activity come to mind? Um, is an activity that stands out or is there an activity that stands out if not Skittles? <laughs> um, gosh, so we, we do, uh, all of our activities are very candy focused. <laughs> we have another activity with Hershey's Kisses, um, which is about building confidence intervals in our statistics classes. And again, normally in class, I would hand out those, those um, to the students and, and they would you know, do a little sampling technique with them. And so we thought about ways to adapt that for remote teaching and learning. And we came up with an asynchronous discussion board um, where we posted videos of ourselves running through the activity and then asking the students to find household items that they could do the same thing with. Um, I used coffee beans. Some of my students used you know, coins. Um, some had Hershey's Kisses on hand, so they were able to use those. 
um, but just really kind of thinking outside the box and creating a discussion board for students to engage in the same activity asynchronously and then posting the results and seeing what other students in the class did and, and comparing their confidence intervals with each other. Um, other lesson plans have required um, things like that with kind of hands-on in-class activities that we've used a lot of Rossman chants um, applets to kind of model that with the students and show on the screen, um, you know, a sample that's being taken and, and looking at things through, you know, hypothesis testing. Things like that. I'm teaching statistics right now, which is why I'm so heavily involved in the statistics community of practice. And, and I'm sure that the pre-calculus and business calculus communities of practices are doing the same thing, finding those online resources. So, and here's, here's just a sample of one of our recent community of practice, um, you know, I almost said lesson plans, but no, meeting agendas. <laughs> um, you know, starting off with an icebreaker, talking about what's going on in our, in our virtual classrooms, sharing resources with one another, things that we found from various, you know, all of us are going to so much professional development right now because we need to have more support in being able to teach online. So, you know, we go somewhere, we find a resource, we share it with the community of practice so that way others have that same resource as well. Um, and then, you know, talking about Canvas and Zoom, spending a lot of time talking about, you know, how are we gonna do final exams on Canvas and Zoom and, and how, how can we help students um, through what we're doing on Canvas and Zoom. So just a little sample. And then, um, you might be thinking about how you can start a community of practice on your campus. Um, so these are some suggestions about how to get started. First, I would recommend securing funding so that way there is that incentive for full-time and part-time faculty to participate in the community of practice. Um, at Cuyamaca College, we decided to pay instructors on a stipend so that way there was equity in pay rather than using something like a classroom rate where a full-time faculty member might make more than a part-time uh, part faculty member. So securing funding was kind of the first step. Um, and then next, finding a time to meet uh, that works for everyone. Uh, one of the things there at our school, our, our communities of practice are not very large. You know, our statistics community of practice maybe has um, eight people in it. Um, our business calc is much smaller. Our pre-calc is probably about the same size. So it was fairly easy to coordinate our schedules to find a time that works. Um, I know other colleges like Pasadena City College is much larger. And so they, instead of doing a meeting with every statistics teacher, they kind of broke it up into groups of three or four. And just those three or four teachers would get together as their own community of practice to talk about what's going on. So, Think about what's going to work best for your college and the size of your uh, department and, and finding that time to work for faculty to meet. Identifying a facilitator is very important um, and it doesn't have to be the person that has the most experience. Uh, it has to be someone who's willing to keep agendas and monitor meetings mostly. Um, our agendas are made up by the people in the community of practice. We email the facilitator with things we need to talk about or questions we have and they add it to the agenda. So it's more of like a record keeping person than someone who's the person with all of the answers. Um, I suggest meeting a few times before the semester starts if you're thinking about starting a community of practice for the fall. Uh, maybe meeting a couple of times over the summer virtually uh, just to get things in order with the start of the semester, maybe talking about what's in your syllabus, talking about some early lesson plans, and just giving faculty a feel for what's going to happen in the community of practice. And then we started meeting every week and then kind of tapered down as, as we felt more comfortable uh, in our new classroom environment. And the same thing happened with our transition to online learning. Uh, we all of a sudden we thought, well, we're only, we're meeting, you know, twice a month. We need to change that. Let's meet every week, at least for now, until we, we feel like we have our feet under ourselves again. Um, so I suggest meeting every week to start. And then making sure that you're creating that supportive community for faculty where they feel safe sharing about the concerns that they have about what's going on in their classroom so that way they can learn from each other and, and create that that better classroom environment for our students that's really the goal here is to, to make ourselves better so that way our students can succeed and feel supported in their classroom 
so with that, um, I open it up to any other questions that have come up in the in the chat. Anything else? Um, Rachel, I'm going to let Stacy kind of start this off. I've been answering a bunch of questions in oh, the good. chat Thank already. <laughs> no, because some of them were pretty simple to to um, answer. Some of the questions were I'm trying to if I go back and and uh, say them. Stacy, you might have them easier. Yeah, yeah. So, um, for example, uh, are the communities a practice for all faculty teaching the course, whether right. or not they have the co rec or not? Yes, and the answer is yes, mm -hmm. they are. Uh, we do uh, require it for those faculty teaching in the community, teaching uh, with co-rec, and when we give them their assignments for the next semester, we also send a reminder that they are, uh, as part of that, they are required to attend, and then all faculty who are teaching the course, whether it's with a co-rec or not, are invited. So that's kind of how we address that one. I will say that we started it with just those teaching in the co-rec, mm -hmm. uh, and then we realized that there was a major need for everybody, which yes. is also why Rachel mentioned that we're looking at doing it for the calculus sequence, and we're also going to be starting one for uh, quantitative reasoning in the fall. Mm -hmm. We had a, another quick question, which you answered in the chat, uh, Tammy, about um, some activities for pre-calculus. Yeah, just there's, um, Amber asked this question and it was a really good question about, we do a lot of stuff with regards to pre-calculus uh, surrounding the graphing calculator. Uh, and there are some activities and things, not only just for pre-calc, but also for business calc and stats. And so uh, if you look at it is at this, um, Rachel, I have a question for you. The link in this at the end, the box link, is that to the math pathways or just to the stats? It's just to the stats. Okay, I want to change that it. to the yeah. math pathways. So we'll change that link so that when we send this out, you will have um, that link that will send it out to, uh, it has our math pathways uh, folder, which has pre-calculus, business calculus, stats, and anything else you could possibly want. <laughs> Right. And then we have some um, really thought provoking questions um, around some some of the specifics um, for for actually starting and compensating people. But one mm -hmm. of the big ones is how are you all addressing the massive budget cuts coming from the state? Uh, yeah. Will you be able to maintain this work despite the May budget revise? If so, how? So we don't have an actual perfect answer to that question. I will tell you that when our BSOP money ended, which is how we were originally paying the faculty to do this, uh, to attend these community practice uh, meetings, um, at the end of that, our administration specifically, well, all of our administration, but our president uh, supported the community of practice in a line item budget for math, English, and ESL. So there's actually three different line item budgets. So each of the departments got their own and we all got our own funding to help continue this. Her intention with regards to that funding was to continue it in perpetuity. Uh, but with the budget cuts, we know that that might not happen. We also are putting together a, uh, um, a, dr a new draft of a budget if she has to take some of the money away, like what is the minimum that we would need in order to keep this going? Because some of the money that was in that wasn't just for community of practice meetings, it was also for professional development, sending faculty to conferences and workshops and things of that sort, which is obviously the most expensive part of it. So if we take all of that out and we just fund the community of practice, what is that? So we're putting together something to address that so that the president knows what that is. And to address the other question with regards to the facilitator and being paid differently, in the beginning we did pay the facilitator a little bit more than we paid everybody else. They got paid a couple extra hours a week to uh, put things together and monitor what was needed. Uh, it, and now that we're where we are now, we don't do that anymore. The facilitator makes the same amount of money. Yeah, and so I think uh, just building off of this in case um, you didn't fully capture all of this uh, in case I missed it. How were people paid? So, and then in what format, by hour or by deliverable? Uh, we pay based on an hourly rate, but basically it is not, we don't use, 
we don't use our non-classroom hourly rate to pay because we felt that it was really, really important to maintain equity amongst all of the faculty participating and that it didn't seem fair for some faculty to make more money to attend than other faculty. So what we decided to do was create an average of really kind of where the faculty, the non-classroom hourly rate was. Uh, we just gave ourselves a raise actually. It was a small raise, but still it was a small raise. Uh, and uh, we, uh, but we, so we based it on that hourly rate and then we paid faculty for that in a stipend and the faculty get that stipend at the end of the semester. So I'm actually in the process right now of putting together all of what we call um, the, I forget, it's called a SPA. I don't remember what it stands for, but it's some type of a document that uh, we put together that essentially says it's like a project uh, for each faculty member and says what they've done over the course of the semester and how many hours they've participated and then they will get paid in their June paycheck. So that's kind of how it does, how we work it. We have a related budget question. Um, so does that mean that the president, you funded the communities of practice outside of categoricals? I don't know what you funded means or if it's just, I'm, I'm not quite sure. It isn't, it's not it's not in categoricals. It was part of her discretionary budget that she uh, that she gave to us to the to each of the three departments to continue what we're doing. I'm not sure if that answered the question. If it didn't, Mitra, let me know. Oh, looks like it did. Um, and okay, then thanks. Amber also has another question about the funding um, for faculty hours. So, how, about how much per hour does that align to? If you are, are able to share. Yeah, I'm able to share. <laughs> I'm not quite ever sure if I should, but when we first started, uh, we were doing it at $55 per hour, and we had our union just had a, a, um, a lot of changes in our pay, and so all of our pay increased over the last year, and so this past semester, actually just starting right this semester, we went up to uh, $62 an hour to make it more in average of our non-classroom hour leads. Great, um, if, if people have more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we did have a question for you all um, about how maybe the communities of practice, the conversations that have happened in those spaces changed and altered from the beginning into now um, and just how they've evolved over time. Rachel, you get to tackle that one. Yeah. Um, well, so as I as I mentioned, that especially with the transition to remote learning, now we're talking a lot about how are we going to do what we usually do in the classroom, but remotely. Um, so it's been a lot of finding finding resources to adapt our lesson plans, working together, sharing resources, um, and then major conversations around um, student retention and really, you know, talking about how. You know, we need to pick up the phone and call those students that we haven't heard from in a couple of weeks because they aren't showing up to class to just see what's going on with them and to reach out to them with all of the resources that Kiamaka has to help them, whether that's, you know, emergency grant funding or access to food or whatever it is the student needs. Really kind of taking the emphasis off of you need to pass my class to what do you need to survive this pandemic and how can Kiamaka help and by doing that it really kind of brings the student back into the fold. So really talking about those, those conversations um, have, been, have been a huge shift with the transition to remote um, online teaching and learning. Yeah. Rachel, can you talk about how they changed from the first year uh, that oh, we yeah. did this versus <laughs> what they look like now, like without the pandemic? Sure, sure. So again, when we started these in 2016 and we made that transition to kind of student-centered learning, uh, there was a lot of conversations around like kind of classroom management and how to get the groups to interact in a meaningful way and to get them through the lesson plan to that concept that you're trying to, to teach in the lesson because most of our faculty were traditional lecturers. So there was more control over the classroom when you're lecturing where in student-centered learning, the students kind of take the lead. Um, so that transition was a big topic of conversation when we first started. Um, but as, as faculty became more and more comfortable with teaching in that group learning environment, 
we started focusing more on, again, kind of individual students and saying, you know, well, I have this one student that um, is refusing to do their work on Canvas. What can we do to help with that student? So really kind of triaging individual students rather than uh, figuring out how to facilitate that lesson plan in the classroom because we, we now felt comfortable facilitating that lesson plan. We may have tweaked that lesson plan to make it even better over the years. And now we can focus on those individual students that are really struggling and how to get them to succeed in our class. That has been a big, a big shift. Great. Um, also, you, you brought up the importance of addressing the effective domain, both, both for the faculty and the students. And I know that this has been a very traumatic upheaval, um, having to go through a, a change in the middle of the semester related to moving online. As things are, are most likely at many of our colleges going to be online for fall and into the indeterminate future, um, what are some strategies that you're looking to build um, to support that effective domain? Mean, both, both for your faculty and your students moving forward? I know that we've, so Cuyamaca Cares is a, is a um, organization on our campus that really provides that holistic support to students. So talking as a community of practice with people from Cuyamaca Cares about the services they provide and how we can help students with them. Um, pointing students to, you know, online personal counseling, as I mentioned, food resources, um, healthcare resources, uh, emergency funding, those are all things that Queen Micah Cares takes under their wing. And just making sure that, you know, as faculty, we are connected with them and we are helping students get connected with them. We like to connect students with people, not just resources. So if I can have them speak to a specific person, that's even better. Um, so that's one of the things we focus on with kind of the student effective domain. Um, as well as, as I mentioned, rethinking our policies, you know, um, we have these policies that are put in place in face-to-face -face instruction that don't necessarily work for online instruction and, and also rethinking assessments, you know, how can we assess student learning in a meaningful way uh, that kind of minimizing, you know, minimizes things like cheating that you might be worried about on a traditional, you know, math assessment. Um, so things like that are kind of big, big topics for the student's effective domain. Um, for the faculty effective domain, I think the biggest thing is just providing that space uh, for, for those regular meetings and knowing that if I'm having an issue with a student or in my virtual classroom, I only have to wait a couple days until I have my community of practice meeting before I can bounce that idea off of several other faculty members. Just knowing that, that I have that space available is, huge, is a huge relief for my concerns and my, you know, Kind of inadequacies that I feel with this new virtual learning environment, um, knowing that I'm going to have help. Help is on the way. It's just a few days away. I can bring it up at the community of practice meeting. I think that's a big, a big relief. <laughs> There was also something you brought up about um, the communities of practice being a safe space for, for people really to share what's going on, concerns that they have, um, and really supporting the psychological safety, right, of, of people being able to speak, speak what's actually happening to them, what they're thinking and feeling into that space. Um, what are some strategies you might suggest to faculty who are starting their own communities of practice and creating that safe environment? Yes. So when I started participating in, in the communities of practice with Kamaka College, I was part-time faculty. And so I had those thoughts in my head of, I'm trying to get a full-time job here. I don't want to tell them what's going on in my classroom. <laughs> They're never going to hire me if I tell them I can't handle things. <laughs> um, and, and it was the, the facilitators of those first community of practices that I participated in that really made the difference. Um, some of the facilitators felt comfortable sharing their own issues in the classroom, and that was a huge help. Others didn't feel as comfortable, and so what they did is they would kind of couch the issue within a case study. They would kind of find a case study regarding whatever issue it is they're having and bring that case study to the group to talk about. And so by doing that, um, we can all talk about how we might handle that situation without pointing fingers at like, oh, this is so-and-so's issue that they're struggling with in their classroom. We could kind of speak about it in more general terms. Um, and so that kind of uh, lightens the weight off of the facilitator if they're nervous about, about being vulnerable as well. So case studies were, were a big thing. And then we also did classroom observations of each other. 
um, which we haven't done in the in the Zoom virtual world yet. I'm interested in it. We haven't talked about it as a community of practice, but I think it would be very cool to do. But just being in someone else's classroom and watching them do their thing is is enlightening. You'll pick up so much stuff from watching someone else teach. Um, so that was another thing that we did um, to help because then after we watched each other in the classroom, we'd go back to the community of practice and talk about what we saw, what someone did really well, um, what you learned from watching them and it kind of highlighted those things. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rachel and Tammy. Uh, the questions have kind of slowed down um, to this point. And uh, again, you are free to contact Tammy and Rachel. Um, they have very graciously shared their contact information and have been doing a lot of work with CAP recently to support uh, our, our statewide communities. So uh, uh, before we end our session, Tammy and Rachel, do you have any last shot thoughts to kind of share with the group? about how they might move forward and move forward in a virtual world right now. I would just say that if you don't already have a community of practice to please consider um, getting one, it has made it so that way the faculty that are involved in the community of practice keep coming back semester after semester because they, they enjoy what's going on in the community of practice. They learn from each other. Um, and you know, we mentioned the budget cuts possibly being an issue and, and we're having those conversations of if we're not funded, are we still going to meet? Um, and, and just the importance of the community of practice is, is so valuable to those involved. Um, so really find a way, <laughs> find a way. Ditto. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, spending your time and sharing your insights with all of us. Again, uh, this information will be posted both on the Vision Resource Center as well as the California Acceleration Project page. So we highly uh, encourage you to go check out those spaces, both the recording and additional um, materials such as the, the presentation itself with the resource links will be available in those spaces. So. Um, with that, um, I, will, I will let Tammy um, address any last questions via chat, but thank you so much for spending your Tuesday with us and we appreciate you all and wish you and your students well um, as you're moving forward and, and hopefully engaging in some of these really innovative community practice, uh, communities of practice at your own college. So thank you so much.